Temos som. Muito, muito boa tarde. Muito boa tarde a todos. Uh, meu nome é André Tavares, sou programador da Garagem Sul uh, Exposições de Arquitetura do Centro Cultural de Belém uh, e é um prazer muito grande ver acolher-vos a todos nesta sala uh, para acolher a Marina Tabassum e ouvir o que ela tem para nos dizer. Queria-lhe agradecer uh, especialmente o facto de ter vindo do Bangladesh até Lisboa, para partilhar connosco o trabalho que tem vindo a fazer. Um, queria também uh, fazer um agradecimento espe especial um, à, à Fundação HACAM para o Desenvolvimento, que uh, apoiou em particular esta, esta conferência, da série Conferências da Garagem. Um, Terá algum eh, sentido eh, esse apoio, especialmente à conferência da Marina, na medida não só em que um dos projetos, uma das obras eh, que ela projetou, arquitetou, eh, ganhou o prémio no ciclo eh, anterior, eh, mas também eh, foi esta semana anunciado eh, que eh, faz parte, é agora... Eh, Vai integrar o membro do. vai integrar, perdão, o Comitê de Gestão eh, deste prestigioso Prémio de Arquitetura, eh, que, que aliás foi um, há cinco anos atrás, cuja cerimónia de entrega foi aqui feita em Lisboa. Eh, a Marina Tabassum eh, faz parte de uma geração de arquitetos eh, que está eh, a trazer novas ideias, novas formas de pensar e novas formas de projetar e transformar uh, o mundo um, e que nós estamos a, a, con a convidar regularmente para as conferências da garagem para partilhar uh, essas ideias e esse pensamento e esse entendimento da arquitetura como uma, uma prática responsável e consciente e, uh, de transformar e de construir e, nessa medida, queria um, uh, pedir-vos que me ajudassem a, a, como se diz, a acolher a Marina para a conferência que nos vai apresentar. Obrigado. So, uh, do I have to do something or do you do it from there? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming here. It's a, well, it's a full house. I'm deeply humbled by that. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, I hope I can do justice. <laughs> um, so basically today I will be showing my works, some of those, some selected works. Um, and um, to basically, even before talking about the way I approach architecture, I think it's, it's very important to understand where I come from, uh, the place, the location, because um, in many ways those are the ingredients that inform my architecture. So I will start by showing you a little bit of Bangladesh. So that's Bangladesh, if you see. Um, this is the Himalayan range up here. And there is, from the Himalayan range, there are two major rivers coming down. One is the Ganges, and the other one is the Brahmaputra. And both these rivers meet and then flows into the Bay of Bengal. And this is actually the Ganges Delta, in fact, the largest delta in the world. And this is where Bangladesh is located. And we have the entire landscape is absolutely, you know, you can see how intricately waved with water bodies. And we have more than 700 rivers crisscrossing the entire landscape. So what is land and what is water? There is no definite demarcation. There is no definite line between water and land. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting chemistry between land and water. So that it cannot, you cannot really distinguish one from the other. And since delta is formed by accumulation of silt over a period of time, 
It's a very soft and fragile soil. So, and the rivers are mighty rivers. And so basically, at one point, they erodes the banks, and, and some other place, it emerges. So this is a constant play of emergence and erosion that goes on. So there is nothing solid or concrete. There is no line as such between land and water. It's a constant shift and play. It's a very fluid landscape. Um, as it's a delta, it's a very, very, very fertile land. So we have agriculture as one of our major economy. Also, having water has its benefits, fishing, lamb, using as transport facilities. The other interesting thing is that uh, during the monsoon season and the dry season, the land, which at times submerges and turns into entire water body, again, during the dry season becomes land which people cultivate. And that has been the way all through centuries, and that's how people still do it. At time, it just gets flooded entirely, so it becomes water. People do fishing or even have paddies or rice cultivation. And during the winter season, when it's a dry landscape, well, we have it as a more of a agriculture land. So it's, it's a constant, uh, you know, there is, we do not, or at least at till, till now, there hasn't been any sort of technological intervention into the landscape in that sense. People still live with, you know, in a way, negotiating with land. And so that's why informality, or let's say impermanence, is a major, major uh, thing that is in the psyche of human beings. So negotiation, I think this is a wonderful way of explaining what is negotiation. This is actually a river. And during the dry season, the rivers get this water hyacinth and it becomes completely clogged. And what happens is people have, then from one side to the other side, you cannot take the boat uh, from, from one side of the river to the other side of the river. So people bring all their boats together and create boat bridges so that you know, they pay a very small amount of money and you can cross over the boat bridge. So that's how people negotiate with land. And they also appropriate whatever space is available, they optimize. So negotiation, optimization, and appropriation are probably the most interesting way of living lives. To talk about the climate, Tropic of Cancer is actually passing through this line over here. So it's a very subtropical climate, which means we have a uh, half of the year, or let's say five months of the year, we get monsoon, which is heavy rainfall, uh, summer months, and it's quite humid. And the rest of the time, it's dry, and uh, there is no rain. So there is these very two different atmospheres that you find. So rain is something like a blessing. We enjoy rain. We uh, we celebrate rain because it's in the summer months and it cools down the temperature. It's also something the land needs for cultivation. So land is celebrated, rain is celebrated, the monsoon season. And then there is this dry season when everything gets very dusty because our soil is so fragile and so soft, it's almost like powder. So it becomes very dusty. So it also helps when it rains. So to live in Bangladesh, what architecture is really needed? This is, I think, the most primordial way of placing architecture because you can see that, that all you need is a roof on your head, and that's it. That's all architecture requires because the temperature is more or less moderate. Uh, as long as you have shade and you, have, uh, you can cover yourself from the elements, that is just enough. And you need a plinth to raise because of the water that comes in. So basically a plinth and a roof on the head. And that's all architecture requires. So quite often from the very early times, you'll see that architecture is all about openness, about blurring the edges. It's always about, it was never a demarcation between indoor and outdoor. It's always uh, a connection between the both. 
And this is one of my very first projects where we ex explored this idea of how you can connect the outside with the inside. So the facade, which is these large openings, are open. Uh, you can open them, it's a flexible opening, so you can create a solid facade or you can open it up to bring in the nature. So we call this a pavilion apartment. This was also shortlisted for the Aga Khan Awards in 2004. So here also you can see that when you open it up, the entire, so the room becomes a veranda. Courtyards. Courtyards are very important in our climate because it's, it's in a way the soul of a household. Um, it, it basically helps with the, with the airflow, the ventilation, it cools down the air and it lets the other spaces breathe. And this is also a place where all kind of regular activities take place. That's in fact the courtyard where I grew up. That's my home <laughs> courtyard. It doesn't exist anymore, but um, that's where I grew up. So when I designed this apartment, we also had a small open to sky nature court, we call it. And this had a high volume. And what does the high volume does? It creates this stack effect where the air, uh, hot air goes up and air from the sides fill in. So it creates a draft of air, constant draft of air. And when you are in a hot, humid climate, this constant airflow is a very necessary thing because it creates this cross ventilation which makes the space uh, habitable. So, so breathing is very important. Every space or every building must breathe. Breathe on its own, not with air conditioning, but breathing through the architectural, uh, you know, the way the architecture is designed. So that's basically the section of the building. Uh, that's the high volume of the courtyard, and this is basically the other spaces. So that's how it gets. It's a small, tiny apartment on the top floor uh, of a six-story building. So it's, it's only about 120 square meters of space. That's when you see from the top. That's the courtyard. And in a similar kind of a project where uh, it's also a smaller, very small, uh, sort of a weekend house in the outskirts of Dhaka, where we designed a nine square grid plan. And the central space is uh, the atrium or where actually the air flow happens. And these corners are also small courtyards. And these are the habitable spaces on the middle. That's the building made out of brick. And you can see that these, these corners are the courtyards and there is this central volume which actually rises and takes the air out. So this is also done in brick, a very, very low budget project. Uh, and so uh, the brick we had was not the best of quality. So we used uh, brick dust and lime to have it uh, finished in a way so that it gives a very homogeneous feeling. So brick is a material of ours. Why? Because it's a delta. We don't have any stone. We only have earth or mud. So from, let's say, second century BC, we have beautiful Buddhist monasteries which were built with bricks. And uh, from second century, third century BC. So, I mean, it's a material that is off our land. And this is what still date used as a construction material, which is available, which is uh, uh, also affordable uh, for any kind of construction. And we also have these beautiful um, temples, Hindu temples, where you can see the intricate terracotta works, also all done in mud or earth. So brick is our material. We have wonderful brick masons. And in our construction industry, both women and men work side by side. <laughs> and these are the masons from the North Bengal. And if you see in the middle right here, this is an Aga Khan Award winner mason. And 
So one project was where we have so many brick kilns because this is our main material of construction. So this is one of the brick kilns under construction. And um, these are new kind of brick kilns where uh, it, these are created uh, in a sort of a hybrid Hoffman brick kiln where they produce very little uh, carbon. So to reduce the carbon footprint, uh, these are new technologies where uh, they add coal to the brick material and they burn it. So then they, it does not emit enough carbon to the atmosphere. So it's a kind of a CDM project where it's a carbon trading uh, project. So my uh, job or one commission for us was that you create a small space for people to stay or to sort of a visitor center or somebody can stay there like a guest house. Um, so this is what we designed, uh, taking from the idea of the brick kiln. Uh, so you can see that's the plan, more like a capsule. And uh, it's the brick kiln turned into a much more higher volume and um, created into a small space, which we designed for a uh, to be placed right next to the brick kiln, which you just saw. This is yet to be built. It's not built yet, so. The other thing which is important to understand is handcrafting and imperfection. Everything we build is handmade. Be it a 30-story building to a one-story building, everything is handmade because there is very minimum uh, use of technology in that sense. Uh, you'll see a few, one or two crane maybe, but most of the things are people are carrying in the, on their head or everything is getting done with hand. So crafting with hand uh, and the imperfection that comes because of crafting with hand is something we celebrate. It's something we, uh, we believe that it's a part of the culture, the way we build things. So, you know, trying to perfect uh, the imperfection of built with hand is not something there. So you'll see a lot of, uh, in most of our projects, where people, this is my, um, the guy here. He's also an Aga Khan Award winner. <laughs> he's, um, he's our, um, uh, the person who does all the uh, floor works or uh, work with stone or any kind of uh, terrazzo uh, works. So here he is working, and you can see this little fountain that's in that apartment was also built by him. So in this very project, we had travertine um, as a stone, which we basically sourced from a an old project or a, or a hotel project where these were absolutely, you know, the leftovers of the project. And we took it and we, we used uh, these travertines in different sizes, different shapes, because that's how it was available to us. So we basically placed them in different, and this is the guy who actually, our wonderful person who actually did it. We also have uh, these porcelain works that you can see over here in one of our projects. These are rickshaw painters who does beautiful rickshaw painting and we took that idea of rickshaw painting and used it in a bathroom. So we try to encourage or use a lot of artisans and crafting that are there in the lands uh, in, our, in our country and try to give them enough opportunity and also to enhance the pride of their work. So quite often, uh, projects do not have proper drawings like you generally have, like formal drawings and given to a contractor to build. We quite often go to the site, talk to the people, and decide on site. So a lot of drawings look like that, that you go there, you discuss with them, and then you, and then you come to a resolution, and then finally uh, things get built. So there is also this informality in how we create architecture. So that's Dhaka. If you see right here in the middle, that's uh, surrounded by water body on all sides. 
on this side, this side, there is this one river down here on the south, and there is one river up here, which actually, basically, Dhaka is completely surrounded by water bodies. But it has grown. It has grown tremendously in the last 20 years. And um, that's one of the views where you see how formal and informal live side by side together. It's a city of 20 million people, so it's dense. <laughs> it's very dense, unlike Lisbon. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's a challenge when you have a city where you work where uh, the density is so high, and which means that uh, giving people enough accommodation. And quite often our sections look like this. We don't get to do nice uh, single-story houses or, let's say, villas for people. That would be a luxury, and I haven't ever <laughs> got a chance to design one yet because it has always been uh, at least between 6 to 12 story or even more. So because you need to, you know, such a density of people that you need to uh, stack them together in blocks. So that's what a, a typical section of a Dhaka residential uh, place would look like. So one of our project, which was located somewhere around here, and if you see this road, which is actually the north-south uh, spine of Dhaka city, uh, it, it's in fact one of the major spines because Dhaka is moving from north to south, and, and this is the one of the major spines of the city. So this becomes quite you know, it jammed with traffic most of the time. And the site is right next to here, over right here, on, on looking this uh, street. And as I mentioned, that building needs to breathe themselves. So this is a kind of a plan we created for that apartment project where uh, you have the main core in the middle, and there are two apartments on two sides. And we opened up the sides uh, Wind is always flowing from the south, so we try to bring in the south wind from the sides and let it out uh, from the north. So the idea was to make the building breathe, and this breath breathability of a building has always been a very conscious decision throughout every project. So this is what the building looks like from the jammed road. <laughs> and um, the idea was to create a facade, of course, the breathing facade, but at the same time a facade that people look at, and it's a city facade. It's not like balconies opening up with a lot of clothes hanging there. That's what you generally see, but we didn't want that. We wanted that from the main avenue, it should be a facade which people enjoy when they, uh, when they look at it. So that's the building. It's a, it's a developer project, and this is the only one developer project I've ever built. <laughs> So coming from that similar notion of breathability and breathing of a tropical architecture, uh, this is one competition we uh, entered. This, is, uh, this was a competition for a building, which would be for uh, uh, the city authority who actually gives permission to build. So uh, what this was supposed to be their headquarters, and we had a competition. And they had a, quite a huge program. And so this was our proposal. So the way we thought about the building was that you, you create, we created these uh, diagonals to bring in air, and we created some courtyards in the middle so that there is the airflow, that draft of air that climbs up through those spaces. And this is a parking lot. But if you see that the building depth is not really very big, so, th so that there is enough uh, daylight coming from one side to the other side, and the building can be lit throughout the day uh, as long as daylight is available. So the depth of the building is done in a way that it can enhance the daylight while people are working inside the spaces, and also uh, ensure airflow. So these, there was also these office rooms and everything should be in a similar way. So the section looks like that. So these are like linear uh, building, tall buildings. 
and air would come in from the sides and climb up. So it would be an, definitely an air conditioning is required, but at the same time, a building should also work on its own. If you, you, don't, you don't need to have air conditioning if it's not necessary. And in our country, we have a huge shortage of electricity, so in a summer month, we could have like two to three hours without electricity. So at that time, you need your building to work on its own, otherwise they won't work. So you cannot have a very f uh, solid, artificially uh, ventilated building. The building needs to work on its own. So that becomes a bit of a challenge. So that's where we need to focus on when we're designing. So this is what we made the building look like. So this is again another, oops, sorry. Uh, this is an interesting project because um, it has an interesting story. You can see how dense Dhaka is. I mean, that's Dhaka. And the southern part here is, is even more dense because this is more the lower income people live. And um, one of uh, the project that I have done is somewhere around here, uh, which is in a very dense neighborhood. And the member of parliament who is responsible for this area uh, basically gave me a call and asked me if I could design a community center for him. And you know, generally the politicians, they have an agenda. So he said, you know, design it in two weeks. I'm giving you two weeks time. So, well, I didn't even get a chance to go to the site. <laughs> I said, all right, fine, I will just design something. And he said it was more of an election agenda. So they just wanted a beautiful photograph uh, to show to the people that this is what's coming if he, if he gets elected. <laughs> so anyway, I, we were sent a drawing of the site and I just designed something which kind of looked like this. And it's in the neighborhood of a very um, dense area. So I thought maybe a nice brick building because there is a lot of chaos all around. So I thought let's, let's bring in some order into that chaos so that this becomes kind of a, a space where you know, people come and get some sanity. Uh, in this uh, chaos. So this is a picture that uh, was there, and for about three to four years, there was nothing. So I thought, okay, fine, wonderful. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we get a phone call, and uh, we hear that the foundation is already done for the building. So now they're asking for working drawings. And... <laughs> And that was like, you know, that's the kind of informality and the craziness we deal with at times in Bangladesh. And I thought, goodness, I've never even been to the site. <laughs> so then, of course, we had to rush to the site to see what the site looks like. And there was this huge drawing on the site with my name on it. And you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, it was quite a situation because people knew my name that I'm designing the building and I had no clue. So this is the only, I would say, the most irresponsible thing I've ever done, <laughs> I confess, <laughs> that, um, that I designed a building without going to the site. But hopefully, and hopefully it really worked so, f I mean, so far, so forth, it worked well. And this is now under construction and you can see the building coming up. Uh, so hopefully next time I can show you more photographs of that. Uh, this is uh, again another con uh, competition, and it is a competition of, a, uh, of an embassy, a French-German embassy. So the French and the Germans decided to make an embassy together in Dhaka. <laughs> Let's hope the European Union stays, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's the uh, American embassy, and right behind this is the Canadian embassy, the Chinese embassy. The, so the French had a space in this entire diplomatic enclave of Dhaka. So this is the site where um, the French has the land and Germans do not have a land. So they came to a deal that the French will give the land and the Germans will pay for it. So they will make a building 
and they will occupy it together. And they called a competition, and we were one of the shortlisted ones to be taking part. So the site, uh, of course, as it's an embassy, um, it has a high security. So there were 25 meter setbacks from all sides. So at the end, we ended up with a very small footprint, which is in the middle. And they had, of course, a lot of programs. So we had to go high up. So that's what we did. Basically, um, that's the site. There's a school, a French school, which is at the back. That's not part of the site. So this is actually the site. Uh, and on these areas, on the four corners, we have the passport and the visa section. This is the entrance uh, porch. Uh, the cafeteria is at the back, and the services are here. And the main embassy is here. So the, both the ambassadors would sit in the same floor, and there would be different functions on the other floors. So that was our design, and we won first prize for this project, but we didn't get to build it. A French architect built it. So uh, basically, that's uh, the, the ground floor plan. And these are the different plans. So we, again, had that similar idea of having a central atrium. And we cut the corners to let the air in. Even though it's supposed to be an air-conditioned building, we, we kept provision for uh, natural ventilation, if required, and also light. And at the same time, uh, they didn't want any kind of opening to the streets for security reasons. So the corners actually help uh, to bring in uh, the light and the ventilation. These are the sections. And that was our design for the building. It was designed as a concrete building. Now I will go and talk a little bit about the history of Bangladesh or how Bangladesh was born because the next project is, uh, requires that. So if you see, this is the Indian subcontinent. Uh, both are maps done in 1909, uh, uh, basically showing the red, red map is showing the Hindu population, and the green map shows the Muslim population. And the densest of the areas are basically the denseness of the uh, different religion. Uh, and based on this maps, actually the entire Indian subcontinent was divided into three parts. Uh, which became India and Pakistan. Pakistan was the Muslim population, and India became the Hindu population. But Pakistan, if you look at the plan again, uh, was actually divided into two parts. This area, which is now Pakistan, was the East Pakistan, and this area, which is now Bangladesh, was the West Pakistan. Or this is the West Pakistan, and this is the East Pakistan. And between east and west, there is about 1,700 miles of land, of Indian land. <laughs> and if you know Indian subcontinent, in every 100 miles, everything changes. The language, the culture, the clothes, the food. And you can imagine between 1,700 miles <laughs> how much of difference that could be. So basically, it was one of the largest mass migration that took place uh, during the 1947 when the entire subcontinent was divided. And so Hindus and Muslims had to resettle themselves. So it was a forced mass migration. Um, and it's a, it's a very tragic history in that sense. And my family is also part of that because my family comes from the Indian side. We had to move uh, to the Bangladesh part within a night or something. I wasn't born, but my I've heard stories from my father that they had to leave behind everything and just you know, run with their lives. So that's a very tragic history. But what's interesting is that between 1947 to 1971, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a history of struggle between these two parts. Because except for religion, we didn't have anything in common. We spoke two different languages. We had our cultures different. This, the histories were different. Everything was so different that, that I, they could not really see eye to eye. So basically at the end, in, after 1971, uh, there was a war broke out. There was a revolution. And it was basically a very struggled time from 47 to 71. And uh, 
we ended up with a war uh, in 1971 from March to December, nine months long, very uh, intense, brutal war, and a lot of people died. And at the end, uh, so if you see this, this is our uh, father of the nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who actually declared that we need to be free. So in March 1971, the, there was declaration of war. And in 70, 1971, 16th December, uh, the Pakistani forces actually um, surrendered to the allied forces of India and Bangladesh. So um, this site, this is actually the site for my next project uh, because um, uh, in 1997 there was a competition, a national competition, where uh, uh, the government wanted to make a museum for the Liberation War and a monument uh, for the independence. So that was one of my projects and we won uh, the competition and at that time, it was in 1997, I graduated in 1995. So for, me to, for us to win a competition in 1997, which is within two years of my graduation, was a really big responsibility. And um, so and, yeah, that was, this was done through my older partnership, Arbana. Uh, it was me and my partner. We were both responsible for the project. And um, so... Basically, that's the story or the history of the site. It used to be a horse racing ground during the British time. And of course, there was this political uh, gathering space uh, during the Pakistan era. And then, of course, with, uh, as, as, the, as it turned into Bangladesh, uh, basically it became a place where people gather. So it's a culturally very vibrant space. So that's where it, it makes absolutely sense to create a museum in that area. But if you see, again, Dhaka, the denseness of it, you'll see that there are very little open spaces available. So that's the parliament complex by Louis Kahn, and uh, these are, this is where my site is located. And so there are very small, very uh, little green area that you can find. So to build up a museum in a park-like space uh, which is actually one of the rare green parks left, uh, just did not seem like the right thing to do. So what we did was, um, this is the site. So we went for a very minimal intervention, like we took the minimum of space that is required and we created a plaza, and that would be the museum. If you see closely, I mean, this was our site. We've kept the entire site as a park, and we've taken this much of space. We have a reflecting pool and a, and a walkway all around it. And this plaza would become the museum. And so this is the plan. It's, the, it's, a, it's a long plaza, which is about only five feet height. So your eyes do not get you know, obstructed. You can see the entire span of the park. But on the plaza, there are only a few elements uh, that actually symbolizes the entire history of the war. Uh, this is a small monument to the 7th March speech by the father of the nation. There's a central pool, which is the water body, uh, has a small hole in the middle. The water gets uh, taken into the space. And at the end, as you come along, this is the main tower of uh, the independence. So it's a basically a journey. You come up here, and then finally you reach. And there's a wall right next to it. And through the wall, if you go down, you'll find the museum. So that's what it looks like. So if you, go, if you take this wall and you enter from one of these openings, you'll go down and find the museum. In section, that's the plaza. So that's all you see on the, from the park. That's the monument and a wall. And the museum is below grade. So that's what you have, if you see all the different elements. And that's the museum below grade, underneath. So these are the ramps that take you down. Uh, that's an audiovisual room. There's this central chamber where the water body is, so that's a small space. And then you come up. 
And these are all double walls, so all the air conditioning and everything is hidden within that. So um, as I mentioned that uh, this project, we started in 1997, but the government, um, it, it went through a lot of time, difficult times, because in 2001, the government changed, so the next government was not interested in the project, so it was under lock and key for a long time. And then uh, again, it started, so it took us 16 years to complete, <laughs> finally. Um, so that's the longest project I've ever done. So if you go underneath, these are the spaces where we have uh, things printed on the glass, all the history. So it's a very, um, uh, it's not a very documentation museum, it's more like a space where you get the history of the entire um, uh, war and the struggles that has happened. I'll just take you through, and that's the water that you've seen on the top, and it's being receded into the space. So it's a space where there is no, uh, no, no visuals or nothing. You just go there, you, it's a place where you contemplate, you remember those who were lost in the war, and um, uh, so it's a space of contemplation. And then you come out, And through these spaces, you go up. I have a small video, if I can run it. Okay, so, so now come to the tower. So I'll just go very quickly. So the tower uh, of independence, where did it go? Okay. So uh, this was conceived as a light tower, a tower of light, because it is a tower for the independence, and we thought the best way to uh, depict or uh, symbolize freedom is through light. So it's a tower not made out of glass, but made out of light. And so what we did is we took glass and we stacked and created a panel. And I hope I have, I don't know why the images are not showing, but maybe you can see over here that the glasses are basically stacked one top of the other. So it creates a certain kind of a prism. So light gets refracted through the medium of the glass and creates a sort of a glowing effect. So during the daytime, uh, if it's a nice, bright, sunny day, you get this beautiful glow of light. And in the evening, it gets lit by artificial light. So you see this beautiful glow. This is not a rendered image. This is a real image. So, <laughs> so at night, it's more like a beacon of hope for a, for a country, a young country, which is younger than me. <laughs> And this is on the 16th of December when we have our independence celebration. Uh, that's the amount of people we have. So the plaza becomes a place where people have concerts and it's a nice gathering space. So um, this is Dhaka. <laughs> I'm sure I'm, I'm scaring you all <laughs> by showing all these images. But uh, yeah, how do you build buildings in these places where where there is so much of people and so much going on. So engaging people and creating sense of ownership was one of the major elements when we designed the mosque. Uh, so this is the end of Dhaka, which is the northern part, and that's the location for the mosque project. And um, if you look at the drawings here, I mean, this Google images, you see how quickly the entire landscape changes in Dhaka because of this intense density, uh, which used to be a farmland. Very quickly, within a very short time, 
became this uh, settlement. So people started living there. But this was not even within the city limits. So my grandmother here, uh, she donated a piece of land from her own. And um, you can see that still here, uh, it was still a village when she donated the land. But when we started construction or we finished it, by that time it was already a, a kind of a settlement and um, not within the city corporation area. So this was the first um, prayer under the jackfruit tree where we first had uh, the declaration that this land has been given to the mosque. And um, so then began my work on uh, creating the mosque. So this was my research, that what was the first of mosque that was built. So basically, if you go into the very uh, first mosque of Islam, which was built by the prophet himself, it was taken out of a house form. So it was basically the house form that was then elongated into a mosque uh, form, which you see here. There was no uh, notion of any symbols at that time. And, and so um, that was one point that actually a mosque is a very simple, humble space where people gather, uh, they, they congregate uh, to, to do a prayer, which is a communal prayer. And during the Prophet's time, it was not only a space for prayer, but it was also a space where people gathered uh, to use it as a communal space, as a social space, as a space for administration, as a space for judicial activity. So there were a lot of things that actually took place in a mosque. But with time, slowly, it has just turned into a space for religious activity. So we thought that since this mosque where it's located, uh, since it's not within the municipality area, the government has no plans for any community center, nothing. So we thought, why not a space, which is uh, a space for congregation, for prayer, but could also be used for other uh, activities. So that's why uh, we, we decided to get not to have all the symbolic aspects of a mosque that generally we are associating mosque with these days, to have domes and minarets, but to have a space which is very neutral in a way and the architectural gesture is in the same similar manner. And what I try to do is focus more on, this, on the spiritual context of it. And these are some of the spaces which are very, very uh, inspiring for me. The Mosque of Cordoba, and of course, uh, the beautiful spiritual light of Hagia Sophia. So the beautiful spirituality that you experience when you go to these spaces are really, really very inspiring. And that's why I thought of working with light to bring in that spiritual content. And these are some of the mosques uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, these are from the 13th century when, when Islam came into Bengal. So these are the first mosques of Islam and also taken, the construction system was taken from the, uh, uh, the temple architecture that was previously there. And so basically these are the beautiful structures which was later on not um, carried on any further. And these are the kind of mosques you see in Bangladesh now. Uh, there is no sense of architecture at all. <laughs> and even worse, when you see what happens to the symbols, uh, domes and minarets. So do we really need that? So that's why we decided to sort of make it a space uh, a kind of, again, very uh, sort of order in chaos, because there will be chaos all around. And if you see uh, uh, the plans, this is the temple, from a monastery from the third century BC. These are the um, temple architecture, or the Hindu architecture. These are the mosques from the Sultanate period, which is in the 13th century. And this is, of course, Louis Kahn's parliament building. So these were all my inspiration. And uh, this is the conceptual plan that we came up with for the mosque. So this was all the uh, ancillary facilities surrounding it. We introduced a circular volume 
to make the shift of the axis, which is required for, for a mosque or the prayer space, uh, because it, uh, from the site, the prayer hall actually had a, 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 a 13 degree angle. So we, sh we uh, created that angle by introducing that circular volume. And what happens is these corners are all open to sky, so there is enough light and ventilation, which is constantly coming in my architecture, that light and ventilation is very necessary. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, you enter from this side, that's the south, so that brings in airflow, and all these walls are perforated brickwork, so that it enhances the airflow, so the porosity is there. And then you do not enter straight to the prayer hall, but you take a few bends, and then finally enter into the prayer hall. And this project, of course, had a very, had no budget almost, because my grandmother gave the land uh, and a very small sum of money to start the construction, but later on we had to raise fund from locals, from different sources, wherever we could uh, possibly uh, get funds. So um, every resource had to be very responsibly used so that's why what we did is we have, we made the outer periphery all in brick because brick is the cheapest available material and the construction cost is less. And the main prayer hall we decided to make with concrete because we wanted a large uh, span of space. So this is the only space which has actually concrete and structure and these are the rest of it are load bearing brick structures. And if you look at this uh, entire context, you see that that's the mosque, and there are buildings coming up all around. That farmland is not farmland anymore. It's all built up. And soon enough, all these buildings will come up, and, the, and you will not see the mosque anymore. So the idea was to look within and not without. So there is, it doesn't make any sense to create facades. It's always better to look within. And that's why we created these openings and apertures to the above so we can bring in light and ventilation. Uh, we created a small plinth here so people can gather. Also, these, these spaces become very vibrant uh, in the afternoons because people do not have any place to go, so they really use this tiny little space that is there. I'm just gonna go very quickly showing you the images. These images probably you all know quite well. So as you see that the light is actually the main, uh, uh, I would say the, uh, the beauty of this entire space because we had very basic materials as we had very small source uh, for construction and uh, light plays the main uh, element of adornment or ornament, however you want to put it. So this is a little time lapse, again, a similar way. And it's interesting because you know, every single day uh, is different. And the mosque reacts very differently in every single day. So your two visits will never be the same. So you can go as many times as you want, and it's always a different experience. It has been the same way for me. <laughs> so this is uh, our, one of our occasions where Farouk was there. And we had a small celebration after the award. So the mosque became a small community center. We had a nice table laid out. People had, um, you know, nice lunch. So we arranged this luncheon, and that's Farouk. <laughs> so that's the idea, that you can really use it as different, uh, for different kind of activities. It doesn't need to be always uh, so uh, regimented about praying only. So um, the last project I'm going to show you is uh, a small resort that I'm building to the south of Bangladesh. And this is the southern part of Bangladesh, uh, where you can see all these rivers coming down. And the, 
dark part is the mangrove forest, the largest mangrove forest still alive. And this is where the Royal Bengal tigers live. So it's a very interesting place. And my site is somewhere around here. So the idea was that we can take boat and come to the uh, uh, forest, you can enjoy and then go back and live there. So that's the site over here, and that's the uh, Shundarbon. So that's the landscape, and our site is, is actually right here. Uh, it's, it's surrounded by rivers. And if you see, this is the entire delta, the farmland. You can see how beautifully green, and you can see that these are the villages surrounding areas, and that's the basic site where we had to work. This is the view from the site. And this is what you see all around. It's beautiful farmland. Uh, this is a winter scene where you see mustard seeds growing, mustard flowers. And still you see cow carts. And it's a very so slow pace. Once you get out of Dhaka, it's an entirely different landscape. It's a beautiful country, um, which is still very, very primitive. And so when we went to the site and we saw this very unique way of living, um, it just did not feel right to do architecture, <laughs> or the way we do architecture. I mean, how can you put a building there? <laughs> Wouldn't it be a crime? So that was my biggest dilemma, that what do you do? A lot of things are not showing, I don't know why. I mean, there was a nice sketch over here, but I don't know why it's not showing. Um, so this is, I think, something I wrote at that time, that rural Bengal is uniquely beautiful, the soul of Delta land. It feels like a crime to invade this silence with the roaring noise of architecture. This project gives an opportunity to bring back the lost pride, the belief in the wisdom of the land, crafted over hundreds of years of dwelling in the Delta. And uh, if you look at these images closely, you'll see that since it's a Delta, it's a very flat land. And on a flat land, what people do is they dig ponds. If you see, these are ponds, right here, pond. And then uh, they take the earth out, they create a mound on which they basically place their buildings or the homesteads. So the homesteads are raised, and so when it rains, the water goes into the pond. It's a very simple way of working, but it's a beautiful, uh, ingenious way of working or staying in a delta. Because it's a flat land, you need to create your own contour. So that's how they do it. So you basically create, first you dig a pond, you take the earth, you make a mound, and on which you basically place your houses. And these are the elements of a landscape, I mean, in a, in a village homestead. You'll find storage, you'll find kitchen, all these different elements. Okay, so <laughs> back in action. <laughs> So that was what I was trying to show you, a little sketch. <laughs> and um, as I just mentioned about the landscape and these small little elements, and why this is important is to see that those little elements together actually creates a homestead. And this is all uh, basically surrounding uh, in a courtyard. So it's a courtyard with all these small elements around it that makes a homestead. And this courtyard is actually the absolute heart of the main uh, household. But the courts are never really defined as such. It's a, it's a very uh, fluid space. It, one courtyard flows into the other courtyard and then to the other. So it's a very communally living atmosphere, which is quite unique. And that's how a village is created. So a small one homestead actually creates this large homestead. And this is one of the... Uh, communities that is um, close to the, to the site of our uh, resort. And we made a complete study of all the different villages that are surrounding us. Uh, this is one of the villages which is uh, Potter's Village, so they are all potters living here. And if you see, these are the ladies and, the, and these are their homesteads.
And this is a weaver's village. So we have all these villages and we actually really uh, documented every single household and how they live. Because we, the reason of doing that was, as I mentioned, that it would be a crime to do architecture. So it was basically the idea was um, to take the knowledge that exists in the land and sort of transform that to become or to make the resort. So we br brought in the people of the village and asked them to sh come and share with us their knowledge and understanding and then to create something together. So that's our site. And if you see, that's the river, which is going this way and this way. And that's the only uh, road connection we have. So we basically took that and we made a master plan. So initially, which my master plan was like that before I really understood what was going on. So once we did all the survey and the architectural studies together, then the landscape, it sort of came in a much more fragmented way uh, to take in uh, the landscape and the way the architecture is done in the homesteads. So we created these small courtyards, and so it's, it's almost like a neighborhood where it's almost like another small village. And these, these are the plans we made. And then after that, we actually let the villagers build it. So the villagers took our plan and built the entire uh, uh, resort with their own knowledge and understanding. So it's built with mud and bamboo as construction material. And what we have done is, this is, let's say, one of the young men of that village. He's a potter's son. But what happens is that they have always this idea that they, are, they want to go to the cities to look for a job because there's not enough opportunity in the villages. So what we did is we employed them. And in a way, um, they do not have the pride that was there. Like his grandfather is actually a potter. But he doesn't know how to do pottery because he doesn't find pride in making pottery anymore. So we basically asked that, you know, that, that's his landscape, that's where he lives, uh, his family, that's his grandfather, and the beautiful pottery that they make. And what we did is we basically employed him, that's him, and we said, well, we need some potteries, and this is what we would like to do. He doesn't have the knowledge, so he goes back to his grandfather. So that's how the knowledge transfer again starts. And in a way, we tried to grow this pride of a certain skill or a place and try to replace it, you know, trying to reinstall it into the landscape. This is our construction technique. We are taking, we've taken sun-dried mud bricks and we are using mud mortar and building with mud. That's the roof system. Um, all the villagers making the buildings, all their local techniques. The roofs are made out of thatch, also something which is not there anymore. So we had to find people who can make thatch with uh, these leaves. Women, we have a lot of women working for us. Women do the best plasters ever. <laughs> and so here we are after work, sitting next to one of the cottages. And in a way, uh, that's a very idyllic image we've always drawn as a child. Uh, if they would ask us to draw a village, that's what we drew, because we never knew what it is. It's just an image. It's, it's a sort of an idyllic image that's behind every child's mind. So in a way, that was the idea of bringing it out. And this roof form, which you see, which we have also used, is a very unique of Bengal. It's called Bangla roof. And this word, bungalow, actually comes from the word Bangla. So Bangla roof uh, was something of a very curvilinear thatch, a thatch roof, a pitch roof, but which is also curved. And, and that actually helps to take the water out as quickly as possible. And this was also copied by the Mughals, and you can also see that in some of the temple architecture. These are the textures you find in the landscape. So this is what the resort actually looks like right from the river. So you don't find me there as an architect. All the projects that I've shown you to date, all the projects that you've seen, 
I mean, I'm not there. I, I say that I'm invisible in this project because all we did is the master plan and we've let the people build it. So that actually helped in a way. It's not necessary that all the time an architect has to be present on site. <laughs> During the winter season, when there is less rain, it's dry. You can see the landscape very dry. And it generated a sort of an economy for the village, which was nice. And the other thing we've done is we've created these initiatives. We call it, it's a, the resort is called Panigram. So we have initiatives where we have done craft development workshops. We have created savings group. And the savings group basically save money among themselves uh, to, to do some more works, like we are also now doing uh, $2,000 homes. So that's also another project that's come up uh, from this community development. So a project do not always have to stay within the boundary of a site and the program. It can extend because that makes it sustain. That makes the entire system and the entire environment sustain itself. So that's why we actually went out and reached out to the villagers so that the resort can actually sustain itself and also the surrounding uh, villages that are living there. And it's a in unique process and we find that this is really working well. This is what we do with the $2,000 home projects where we have these small savings group who are saving money and together basically they are giving loans to this community who are savings, saving themselves. And with the $2,000, which is actually not much, 3,000 a goat, uh, with this they are making houses. So this is a $2,000, this is a $1,500 home. Now we have in, uh, in in, made it a little bit more uh, for with two thousand dollars. So this is two bedroom house with a toilet facility, and we've already built twenty projects like that uh, in the surrounding areas. And this is now growing more. The system is quite interesting because we start by doing maps. All the maps that I showed you, hand drawn, these are all done by people of the villages. So we gathered their information and created a map. Uh, these are their own models, their own aspirations. They make their own house models. And then what we do is give them the technical know-how of how to build. And within this small money, how they can really create something unique. So actually, the resort project turned into something else. <laughs> That's where we put more of our... So I, this is just a video, and I'm going to finish it with this. So. I don't think you'll get the sound because I think we've lost the sound. <laughs> Melai banana itu, melai lagi tebal. Anu, anu, anu besi.
This is making the maps when we work with the communities to make the maps of the villages. And they take their own measurements and created their own maps themselves. Thank you. But sorry about the small technical stuff that always happens. <laughs> we all know. Uh, do you have any questions or anything that you would like me to clarify or anything that would be? I think I took a long time, so. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tamanna from Bangladesh. Oh, wow. Uh, Hi. Ki <laughs> khobor, <laughs> balo. I feel very lucky today to be present here in your conference and meeting you today after 10 years because I had been your student from Brack University, Dhaka. Can you stand up? Let me see your face. <laughs> Back in 2008. Oh, yeah, sure. So it's exactly 10 years. Um, I would like to congratulate you and uh, thank you for your everlasting inspiration and contribution, especially for us, like young architects and future architects. Thank you. And uh, I have a lot of questions, but today I will ask just two. Um, so I wrote it down. Uh, apart from our, our mentors and rich contextual forces of Bangladesh, I see Khan, Carlos Carpa, Palladio in your design. What and who are your true inspiration in constructing architecture? Well, you haven't seen Caesar because I haven't showed the project. I've <laughs> that was my first project ever. And, and yeah, so that was a lot of Caesar inspiration in there too. Um, well, um, you know, we have all these giants before us. It's fine to be inspired by people, but as long as you make it your own, um, I hope I make it on, of my own, whatever I've done. And um, yeah, so I don't know, what's the question? <laughs> uh, my question is, what and who are your true inspiration? In my inspiration. architecture? My inspiration, well, there are a lot of inspirations actually. A lot of people inspired me, not just architects. I mean, there was this one person who was doing the craft workshop. He's a person, Chondrasha Khorshaha, very close to me, very inspiring person who is very much into craft and crafting. And in a way, my knowledge of crafting and working with craftsmen 
And even taking that idea and bringing it into building an architecture was also something inspired by him in many ways. Um, and of course, you know, we've grown up watching Kahn's building and, you know, one of the first introduction to architecture was Louis Kahn. So we've learned a lot from that building. I mean, more than what the teachers have taught us in schools. The a building can really teach you if you really know how to engage with it. So my understanding of light, uh, uh, of, of spirituality in many ways, uh, timelessness of architecture, which I try to pursue, which you cannot really guarantee until time really gives its own verdict. <laughs> but you know, a lot of things are definitely um, a lot of inspiration from Louis Kahn. I like Peter Zumthor's projects a lot because he spends a lot of time with each and every project giving it a lot of effort and you know, making it of that very uh, site and of that project. So that's also quite inspiring. I like Caesar's works a lot, absolutely. You know, one of the fascinating, one of the highlights of this trip was meeting Caesar yesterday. So, <laughs> so that's, that was really inspiring for me. So yeah, there are a lot of, lot of people who inspires, yeah. Thank you, Miss. Uh, I have another question. In global context, how architecture should be practiced as a continuity of the past, according to your belief? I cannot answer for the entire generation of architects. I can only talk about myself. Yeah, well, globalization is definitely, you know, I think um, because of globalization and what is globalization, basically, uh, it was triggered by industrial materials and this the same materials, glass and steel, being used everywhere on Earth without irrespective of that location. And I think because of that reason, and also the fact that capitalism required a lot of, uh, you know, commodification of architecture. So that's also one way of this whole entire globalization that has happened. And from the very beginning of my practice, that was my goal or my pursuit that, um, that I don't want to take that path of using industrial materials in that sense. It's nothing wrong with it. I've used a glass in the glass tower. Uh, but the idea was that um, you, need to, you need to investigate into the location, context, the place, history, culture. So when I do my architecture, the material is always, I always talk about it, that the material is the climate, the material is the place, the material is the material that are available, the history of the place. These are all the ingredients or these are the basic elements I work with, not with material as such. So yeah, I think if we practice that, perhaps that might be of some use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, no more questions. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I would like to thank you for the time and the, the possibility. Uh, I would like to pose an um, art question. Instead of high architecture question, I would like to present you a high-minded question. And uh, it's become a cliche that the, the world population is above 55%. And, um, but often we forget to ask in which kind of uh, urban configurations that this growth is happening. And um, uh, the growth of cities is marked today by a paradox, I think, but uh, much of the, gro the, the urban growth of the 21st century uh, is taking place in developing countries, but many of the theories on how cities work or should work remain rooted in developed countries. And uh, the future of the, uh, cities lies neither in Chicago or Milan, but uh, I think that it lies in places like Dhaka, like Rio, like Lagos, Manila, places like that. Uh, and we see indeed uh, extraordinary concentration of uh, knowledge production in small uh, number of OECD countries. And uh, I think there is a biased debate about uh, uh, architecture 
favoring these dominant countries' uh, viewpoints, if you can call it that, uh, and teaching institutions, uh, whether it be in Europe about the importance of uh, historical cities or in the Americas about the, the growth uh, of urban sprawl and suburbanization, um, I think there is a visible asymmetry between the, um, this visibility of knowledge geographies and um, what can we, because posing first world uh, ask, um, questions to third world is super easy, it's super comfortable and I think it, at some point it's uh, rude or, um, uh, or it's uh, obscene, like you said in the, in the presentation. What can we learn from the so-called uh, third world uh, to deal with informality uh, and to deal with formal planning um, that means both of them confronting the apparatus of planning and the operating conflicts of power. What can we learn from you instead of teaching you what to do about these situations? Thank you very much. Isn't that a very difficult question? Yeah. That's the <laughs> I don't know, what can I teach you? I'm not here to teach anybody anything, I'm just showing what I can do. Uh, well, if you see the last project where we tried to address this issue of, uh, you know, you see village, but in a way it addresses this issue of migration. And a lot of people, as I showed that young man, like him, there are numerous young men who are um, has this dream of going to the city, getting a job, getting some opportunity, and that's why people move from their locations, from their places. So this migration takes place because of lack of opportunity in the villages. So if you can create opportunity in their own location, that is one of the reasons why we have these savings groups that we are creating. Um, this is already done in three or four different locations in Bangladesh. So if you, if you take up these small steps, I, feel, I believe uh, that if you can bring back the pride in people of living in the villages, nobody wants to leave their home and go to the cities because it's not a good life. It's just going there, living in a slum, getting a job which doesn't even pay properly. So nobody wants to go uh, in a way. So if you, if you can give that opportunity to them in their own location, it will reduce migration of people moving, uprooting themselves and going to the cities. So that's what we are trying to do. If you can learn something from that, probably that would be my lesson. Um, yeah, what else? Informality exists. I think it exists everywhere, um, uh, so it's not necessary always to formalize everything. There is beauty in informality. That is what I have tried to talk about, so I think that's important. Um, yeah, as I said, that crafting or handmade things, imperfections is part of human life, and that imperfection is beautiful, and we think we need to look at it differently than looking at things as machine-finished, beautifully crafted, uh, by a machine, rather than, you know, celebrating the hands, which is also necessary in architecture, that we start drawing with our hands. Sorry, I cannot teach much. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you.